in the grand scheme of things, we're number one because this is what we do and we're succeeding at what we do and we love what we do. We're not punching a clock for somebody else hating our lives every single day. There are many days that I sat in the bathroom and cried my eyes out because I wasn't sure we were doing the right thing. We may have cussed each other out in front of our employees. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, you wanted it, you got it. The place for the untold, real, raw, and juicy stories of dirt track racing, it's Dirt Track Confessions. And now here's your host, Mandy Pouch-Mahaney. Hello everyone, welcome to Dirt Track Confessions. I'm your host, Mandy Pouch-Mahaney. I am so excited for our guests today. We have uh, Ashley Deal Stremme. She is wife of race car driver David Stremme and daughter of sprint car driver Joe Deal and Ash. I am, I've always, I don't know if I've ever told you this, I've always admired you and all that you have accomplished. I know, I, I, as a young girl growing up, I always had that one role model. And truly, I feel like once I got through high school, and I, I know, I know, I know you, you become like a role model for me, like everything you've accomplished. Uh, I always remember you'd be you'd come back for motorsports, you know, and I'd be like, oh, she's she's just so accomplished at such a young age. And it just it's been incredible, incredible to watch you do all that you've done and to more of the most recent titles you've earned is mom, which like I'd have to say is probably the most you've you're proud of. Right. So, um, Ash, I. I don't want to take all the accolades from you. You have accomplished a lot. You have accomplished a lot. You, you know, your host, um, co-host, what Wing Nation with MRN. You, you and your husband have a successful chassis business. You were Miss Un- Mrs. United States. You did some modeling. You were Miss Motorsports, of course, for everyone in our Northeast who knows that. Uh, you've done modeling. You you built a cup team with your husband together. You know, you've accomplished so much. I, I, I don't even know where to start, but please, Ashley, welcome. Thank you. Well, Mandy, Likewise. Um, it's always been so enjoyable to watch you. Um, I love how involved you are with your brother, your husband, your dad, of course. Um, and so don't think that that isn't vice versa for me as well. I've always enjoyed watching you and admired how involved you are with your race team because I feel like there are few women who are like us. Um, although it is growing and that makes my heart happy because it is a hard industry, um, to be a female in this industry, even with what I have accomplished, um, I still feel like I struggle on the daily to be accepted in this sport, um, to, at some level. Um, so yeah, it's, it's frustrating, it's fun, but it's passion. And at the end of the day, you can't teach passion. You either have it or you don't, and you either grasp it with both hands and run with it, or you sit in the corner and decide to go a different direction. Right. So yes, all, all of the things. Oh my God. So, okay. Let's, let's paint the picture for our listeners and our viewers. What did life look like growing up for you? Man, we were just a small town average Joe that, you know, my dad wasn't anybody big in our community in the racing side of things. Um, His businesses took off. That was a whole different side of things. But we nickeled and dime our way to, to go racing every single weekend. It's what we did as a family. And it's just ultimately how we spent our time together. We didn't, we weren't a camping family. We weren't big on vacations. Just going to the racetrack was, was what we did and where we found our enjoyment. And many of my very first memories in life are, are at the racetrack. So, you know, obviously being in a small town and growing up at Port Royal Speedway, I was extremely blessed. Um, Back then that racetrack wasn't the racetrack that it is today by any means, but um, she was a diamond in the rough for sure, but she was still my home track, right? So um, it's what I love to do with my parents. Um, even still today, now that David's racing, you know, my mom and dad still come to the races with us. It's just a family affair. Um, as we all know in the racing industry, even the guy three trailers down, he's like your brother from a different mother. Hmm. It's it's so true. So speaking of David, how I don't even know. How did you guys meet? I, I'm I'm gonna take a wild guess racing. 
but <laughs> you, you, you nailed it. <laughs> okay. I actually met David back, Lord, 2006, um, through a mutual friend. Uh, we were both dating different people at the time. Um, I met him. That was kind of it. And then three years later, literally the st stars aligned. It turned out we had another mutual friend and I was playing in the lingerie football league at the time. <laughs> And our friend that we had mutual uh, actually worked on David's sister team um, when he was at Penske. And one day they were testing and he was telling his buddies about how he had two friends that played in the lingerie football league. And <laughs> David, it just, <laughs> David just happened to walk by and he's like, oh my gosh, that's Ashley. And he's like, you got to give me your number. And it kind of just all flourished from there. So it's literally the stars had to align. Okay. So kind of racing, but it was lingerie football. That's a, <laughs> that's a unique story. Okay. I was, I, you threw me on that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. I played in the lingerie football league for the Philadelphia passion. Yeah. Um, as a uh, tomboy growing up, I, of course, loved the sport of football. Um, back when I was a kid, you know, girls couldn't play boys sports. Um, so I never had the opportunity to to play football on the peewee team around here or anything. And then so when Laundry Football League became huge in, I don't even know what year that was, 2008, 2009, I jumped at the opportunity because I had always wanted to play football. Um, so... 180 girls tried out. They took 18 and I was one of the lucky ones. And I ended up being a middle linebacker. <laughs> that is amazing. Oh my God. This is, this is why there is no way we're going to list everything that you've, you've done. Because I, you, where do you even start with that? Right. Where do you even start? Like that is insane. So, okay. So your most recent prize and possessions uh, of steel is Kidding. So how old is he now? He'll be two in April. So he's a little bit of a busy body right now. Um, we are hoping so much. David is really hoping that he does not want to get into the racing world, but obviously that's going to be our, <laughs> that's going to be a really hard one to, to not have happen, especially with what we do. And the fact that he's in the shop every single day playing with race cars, real ones, life-size ones. Yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously, uh, it's tough. Um, it's been a, a new venture for me, obviously juggling being a full-time stay-at-home mom while trying to run a business, have a part-time job, and travel 20-ish weekends a year with racing. Um, it's been interesting to say the least. I've dropped the ball on a lot of things, but uh, I wouldn't trade it for the world. That is the next thing I will be calling you. <laughs> Whenever the, the family gets built over here, I'm going to be calling you for that advice because uh, it just fathoms me how busy we are, like Mike and I are right now to add in a, like a little human into the mix. It's just, you make it work, you make it work, but it's, it's a whole different level. So, okay. So, so prior to having steel, like what, what did life look like? Like how much traveling were you doing versus maybe what you're doing now is it yeah so um I mean let's go back to COVID right because that's what our we time stamp everything on life now it seems like oh well when COVID happened mm -hmm. I was traveling literally just about every single weekend um Thankfully, when COVID did happen, the racing world kind of shut down, but not really. Um, and that's when TV took a huge hit with, you know, NASCAR and all the things not really being fan friendly and, and happening. So CBS Sports um, kicked off a deal to cover dirt races. So I was um, basically their pit reporter for that. So I was traveling every single weekend. I was doing sprint car races. I was doing late model races. Um, with the world of outlaws every single weekend. I just basically would find out on Monday where I was headed that weekend, whether it was late, late models or sprint cars. So that was a crazy year. It was awesome to travel because there was literally like 10 people on every flight that I was on. But uh, yeah, so I was traveling just about every 
other weekend, if not every weekend that year. Um, and of course, still running our business because we were in North Carolina at that time and manufacturing was considered essential in North Carolina. So we were manufacturing race cars <laughs> every day during COVID. Um, yeah, so that's also when we started to transition our move to Pennsylvania, um, which was also interesting. Um, we're we're going to talk about that. I can't wait. Yes, that was all very interesting as well. So obviously I'm still traveling uh, 20 ish, 25 weekends a year with our racing long distance. Um, let's put it that way. We're still, you know, we still race within a couple of hours. I don't really consider it that traveling because it's close. We can sleep in our own bed that night. Right. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's a little bit different now. Um, I do try to fly to the long trips um, because a child in a car seat in the toter for, you know, 10, 12 hours doesn't really understand what's going on. And we might bend the rules a little bit here and yeah. there when it comes to that, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, we do try to fly to those long distance races like Volusia here in just a few weeks for Speed Weeks. We're flying round trip just because... He's still free because he's under two. <laughs> so I will fly everywhere I can. And then obviously once he is over two, we will get him his own mileage account so he can start racking up miles too. That's smart. Very smart. I have thought about that is doing the mileage card stuff because it how how often are we on the road? More often than not being home, you know, so that that I guess. Uh, well, because he is okay. I'm I'm thinking like now versus then, but like, what was it like? Okay, so you were living in North Carolina. Pro uh, let's go with prior to you guys being in Pennsylvania. How did you balance between you know life, work, family, your career, your husband's career? Uh, how? <laughs> I don't know. I right? don't know. <laughs> I don't think I, I know. Really don't. Um, I will say I'm, I'm very blessed to have a extremely supportive husband and he respects that my role in racing was just as prominent as his. Um, and I'm very thankful for that, um, mindset that, you know, he's like, listen, you have your life. We, I have my life, but we have our life together as well. And I truly think that's what makes us so strong, um, and we run a business together, right? So like, that's a whole nother can of worms that we struggled with um, at the very beginning of our ownership of, of starting Lethal Chassis. Um, it was hard. It was really hard. I'm not going to lie. There was a lot of nights we went to bed not talking. Um, we truly had to learn that, you know, when we come home at night, like business is done. Like we are now into relationship mode because there are many days in the shop, but I am a very uh, strong willed, <laughs> uh, very determined, sometimes brash, uh, hard headed individual. And so is my husband and that doesn't always click well. So there are many of times in the shop that I am not proud of um, where we may have cussed each other out in front of our employees. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, we have the same goal, right? We both want to be successful. We both want our business to succeed. We just have different ways of getting there. And that was the hardest thing to understand is, you know, we both want the same end result. We just, I may work smarter, not harder type of person where David is more, has that engineering mindset of like, well, we can do it this way to make this happen, to have this happen. And it's not wrong. It's just not the way I want to do it. So the compromise was huge. And like I said, more than anything is knowing that when our business ends for the day, like we have to shut that off. So that was the hardest thing. And once, you know, once we figured that out, it made life a whole lot easier. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, now that we're, 
I don't even know, 10 years into this business, like we still talk business at 930 at night because that's what has to happen. But it's just different now than it was in the beginning because money was tight. You know, we're starting a business. We're taking a risk. It makes everything escalate, um, not just because you're trying to run a business. You're trying to run finances. You're trying to pay your bills. You're trying to get new equipment in, hire new employees. So it's it's a yeah. whole level of things. And then we're racing every single weekend to try to make our product better, to make our business stronger while I'm still traveling. And it, it, it was not enjoyable always. <laughs> this is This is where I feel you and me and then David and Mike are so freaking similar because Mike is the same way. He is the engineer. He likes has to sit back and look at things and look at this way and that way. And I'm over here like it could have been done yesterday. Yes. It could have yes. Been done yesterday. And it's like, how do I find that happy medium with him? We're still working on that. We are still working there. We so our go to. I mean, we should probably start this like a little bit earlier, but um, if we are in like. It's 9 30, 10 o'clock. We're in a deep conversation of something we probably shouldn't be talking about right now. As soon as 10 o'clock hits, we say done. We got to talk about this tomorrow. I should probably make it like seven o'clock. Probably probably. <laughs> yeah. But that that's been our that's been our our go-to the last few years is if we're in a discussion and we know like this isn't gonna end very well, we're not gonna solve the world tonight. Oh. We need to stop talking about it because that's that's the thing is like you guys and us and a lot of other people, we we don't leave racing at, at work. Racing is us. We are racing. It is 24-7. You're always thinking of how to improve, what to do next. And and you two, it's a team effort, you know, and it it falls on the both of you. Yes. And even still, like you're saying, you, you know, we come home last night, we're eating supper. What's on the TV? Chili bowl. You know, like, so it's, it's, it's our world. It encompasses us from the minute we wake up to the minute we close our eyes and it never stops. And then it changes when you have a child, obviously, you know, my child, the minute he hears the national anthem on the TV, he's standing up and has his hand over his heart, you know, like, so it it changes everything. And, you know, sometimes we have to stop what we're watching on TV so we can watch Bluey, you know, like it, yeah. it just, it just changes and the conversation changes. Right. So now we don't really talk about racing until after supper. Cause I just thrash to get supper made and I'm trying to feed my child and I'd like to eat. And David wants to talk business. And I'm like, now is not the time. Like give me 20 minutes to give me my belly full and my child's playing and then we can chat. So it changes obviously. Yeah. Now that has me curious. So, um, you, you've, made like you said you've made a name for yourself like you are not just David's wife or or whomever like you are Ashley and I admire that so much so you've done stuff outside of racing and as as am I right now like I'm doing stuff outside of but yet you still find a way to tie them together like do you feel you know you like, I don't want to say like, are you happy with where you're at? Like you're thriving, you're doing great. But do you feel like you're on the right path of like not losing yourself? Cause there's a lot of women out there that they marry the man and it's like, well, the only way to make him successful is to support him. But at the same time, like you don't want to lose yourself. Right. Um, absolutely. Uh, it's tough right? Especially now that I'm a mom and I'm actually talking about jumping back into the pageant world because I feel like that does help my identity. Mm -hmm. Um, because I'm, I am more than just a mother and a wife. Um, I am my own individual person, but Mandy, as I'm sure, you know, you've dealt with it. Like people still question who I am, you know, like wing nation, perfect example. I've been doing that show for I don't know, 10 plus years now. Right. And people will still make the comment. Well, I don't know why you have her on there. She's just a pageant queen. Well, obviously you don't know her that well. Cause she does have a background in racing. Like, so there's still people who don't know you, who don't, who will discredit you no matter what you've accomplished in life. Right. So ultimately at the end of the day, there 
we're in a unique situation because David was an asphalt racer with no dirt background Mm -hmm. where I grew up in dirt racing and didn't really know much about asphalt racing and absolutely hated it. Uh, But it's what my husband did. So I supported him. Um, So I feel like with David making the transition to the dirt side of things, a lot of our contacts, our connections that we have that are on the side of our car are 50, 60, 70% because of me. Um, Dave Ely at Bulldog Rear Ends, perfect example. My dad and him raced together yeah. all my life. I've known Dave all my life. David didn't have any idea who who Dave was, you know? So I created that relationship for them. Bulldog Rear Ends are in our car now because of me. I was the one that ordered parts up until I had a child from, you know, now David and Dave have built a relationship. So in that kind of thing, you know, David respects that side of things because I do have a foundation, a base that I build on because I grew up in the dirt track world and because of what I've been able to create. Um, but it is very, very, very easy to get lost, you know, in the world of being a wife or just because we are so busy and we are multifaceted and, but I've always been that independent individual. And David will tell you this. He's like, I hate how independent you are. And I'm like, well, my daddy raised me that way and that will never yep. change. So you just gonna have to get used to it. Um, because I've always been the type of person that I don't need a man. I want a man in my life, but I will never need a man. And I will never let that part of me go. No Absolutely. matter how many years I've been married, how many children I have, um, if if I've got to go get a job back in groceries or whatever it may be, I'm not above that. Um, and so that's where I try to always stay grounded and, and keep my roots because I am my own individual first and foremost, and I have my own life, but my relationship and my family are extremely important. So I put them in there as well. I love that. But you do have to take a step back every now and again. Like, I don't want to try to sound like oh it's all about me because yeah. it's clearly not because <laughs> I have been riding the back burner for the last two years because I've been raising my child and that's what's important to me right now is yeah. being able to have the ability to raise my child hands-on every single day not have to send him to daycare um am I, am I doing it myself no absolutely not I have a nanny right now who comes two three days a week and helps out for a few hours while her kids are in school um, but I want to be able to, to teach my child and take my child with me and do things. And that's what, you know, when you have children, you'll understand that, yeah, it's an extra human. You've got to learn to like plan a little bit better. You've got to budget in more time, but ultimately they're, they're just with you, right? Your life doesn't really change. They just become a part of your life. Yeah. I love that. That's so sweet. That's a good, that's a good way of looking at it. So backing up to kind of what you're talking about before I with everything that I do you know growing up in racing dad brother now nephew husband there's too many too many too many it's fine I'll take it but it's too many for me but I feel there are so many times when I feel guilty when I actually skip the races you know it's like oh yes Yes. What did I miss out on? Like, I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. And then you're sitting on your phone like, oh, so and so something happened. He just came off the track. Well, what happened? Like, so then you're sitting there waiting like for the text message to so annoying. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. There's times when like there will be a wreck and I kid you not. I get text messages and about not even 10 minutes later, my husband's already calling me. I'm like, okay, he's live. (laughs) It's great. It's great. He's okay. Like he calls me instantly. But like with what we do, like with your, your chassis business and like wing nation, everything, it's like, well, how dare you go off and want to do pageants and miss racing. And it's like, again, it comes back to like, we have to fill our cups too, you know, otherwise we, we lose ourselves, but that that's my holdup. A lot of times is I'm building stuff. I'm building my own career. I'm building Mandy, but I'm also trying to be the supportive wife and the daughter and the sister and the aunt. But at the same time, it's like, you can't fill from an empty cup. You You can't. can't. And 
that guilt though, it, uh, it's, it's a female guilt. Mm. Like that is not a male guilt. And I don't mean that in a negative way, any way, shape or form, but we as females, uh, take an item you want to buy, right? Like I want this pair of shoes, right? Mm. Well, it's, they're a hundred dollars or whatever. And it's like, oh, do I really need the shoes? I don't really need the shoes, but I really want the shoes. So then you think about it and you go, you don't buy them at the store. You go home, you think about those shoes for two weeks. You go back to the store, you see the shoes, you think about them again, you don't buy them. Then the third time you finally go, okay, I'm just going to buy them. And then you have guilt for regret, like that you regret buying these shoes that you don't really need, but you really want, you do deserve them. Like you've earned the money to pay for them like but men don't think that way like they're like I need this part for my race car hey can you send me this part <laughs> like it's it's so it's just a female thing right I don't know if it's because we can bear children I don't know but I think it's truly yeah. just a female thing that we have that guilt that we're not there supporting it's so true because there was something the other day I went to buy and it crossed my mind I'm like Mike would easily, the, the things he's been buying on Amazon, we were gone for a week. The whole front porch was filled with tools and parts and like knickknacks and these and this. And I'm like, yeah, it, exactly. So that's my mentality of it. screw it. <laughs> yeah, yes. Buy the damn shoes. <laughs> yeah. Buy the damn shoes. Amen. Okay. So, um, I, we kind of talked about this a little bit before starting the the episode is, um, you know, a few years ago, Ashley, Mike and I had visited Ashley and David's shop. They were in the process of all this stuff. And at that time when we visited Ash, you had given me so many incredible tidbits in that small amount of time. I kid you not that it has just stuck with me. And oh. that was one of the many things I was like, I need you on here because you helped me more ways than you even like know. So yeah. So I feel like, you know, our lives correlate in so many ways, obviously <laughs> that, you know, I confide into you with, you know, where Mike and I were at, at the time, life looked a little bit different for us and, you know, you're family oriented, just like we are. Um, you, you just like me, you picked up, you moved hours away from home, from your family, what you grew up knowing and loving to chase racetracks with your husband, to support him, but also, you know, chase after your dreams too, to finally be back home where you've wanted to be. Like literally Port Royal is like your, uh, is it your front yard or your backyard? I'm not really sure. <laughs> it's, it's in, it's in, it's pretty much in her yard. Okay. So with that being said is what would you say you know, helped keep your mindset so strong all those years? You know, did you know where you two would eventually end up? Uh, were there ever times of of the doubt, of the worry, of like not questioning your relationship with David, but are we on the same path? Like, are, like, do you, does he want what I want? You know, you've kind of touched on that, but like, how how did you stay confident enough I guess. Were you? <laughs> no, I just okay, fake it till you make it, right? Like that was it. So, that was it. And and truthfully, sometimes that is what it is, right? Like the world we live in today is is much different than what it was when I was growing up. And so it's hard to see what people post on social media and not compare yourselves to them. Um, and let's be completely honest, very, very, very few people share the bad and ugly. They just always share the good because that's what people want to see, right? <laughs> um, so there is a lot of bad, right? It's just how you choose to determine how you're going to conquer the bad to continue to see the light because it's ultimately going to come. And don't get me wrong, there are many days that I sat in the bathroom and cried my eyes out because I wasn't sure we were doing the right thing. I wasn't sure things were going to get better. So I can't sit here and act like it's all, you know, rainbows and, and gumdrops because it's not. Um, but ultimately, as long as you're driven, you're determined, and you continue to set goals, like you cannot stop 
setting goals. Even to this day, like I said, I'm I'm ready to do another pageant. I want to go win Mrs. America. Like that's my goal right now. And once we accomplish that, then we have to set the next goal. Like you just, I don't care if you're 65 years old, you still have goals to set. They're different than what they look like in your 20s, but those goals never stop. And the minute they do stop, I feel like that's when you stop bettering yourself or or trying or you lose that determination and it won't it's never pretty it's not easy um there are some things that most people wouldn't believe I'd ever do you know um <laughs> but you that's just it right like you do whatever it takes to succeed um mm -hmm. you know my husband still welds chassis together every day. I still clean the bathrooms every single week. Yeah. Like it, people call and they're like, hey, can I talk to David? Well, he's in the middle of building a chassis right now. He welds the chassis together. Well, yeah, this is what we do. Like, yeah. I love that people think that we just have this abundance of money. Unfortunately, NASCAR doesn't have a pension program. Uh, <laughs> we don't live on NASCAR money anymore. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so we have to work for what we have. And it's not easy. It's not fun um, when I'm out front because the septic system backed up and I had to help dig the ditch to get the pipe up. So my dad, who's an excavator, thank God, could come in with his mini hoe and finish the work for us, you know. So that's another thing, right? Friends in low places. Uh, we definitely couldn't do or what we have accomplished here in Pennsylvania, we couldn't have done without our family and friends. Um, it takes, it takes a whole team. Um, and I think you're a product of the people you surround yourself with, um, you know, to have those people willing and wanting to help us. They don't have to, we couldn't pay them. You know, we just moved a business 700 miles um, to start all over again, essentially. And we had to build everything back up here. And unfortunately, the state of Pennsylvania is much more expensive than the state of North Carolina. <laughs> yeah. So there's all of that. And that's just the trials and tribulations of life. Um, but you have to make sure you surround yourself with good people and have, you know, people who are like-minded in your corner that will continue to push you and help you and, and, make you want to succeed and achieve your goals because you can't do it alone. Yeah. One of the things that really stuck that you had said was something on the lines of like, you know, me and Mike, like set yourself like a five to 10 year goal. And you were like, be on the same page, but no, there's going to be like obstacles. It's going to shift. But as long as you both are working towards like the same thing, but no, like the time frame, all that stuff, like, at the time, can we talk about how long were you living in your motorhome? We had lived in the motorhome for 18 months. Oh. Um, we moved out of the motorhome November of 21. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we moved out of the motorhome into 21. And we now currently, we still don't have a house, Mandy. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> yes. Are you in the garage? Where are Almost. we? We are. We are. So the front building where our office section is had an extra space that we are going to eventually. We had started to turn it into our bar game room place so that when we do build a house, we don't have to build that in our house. We have it here. Well, we ended up turning it into a studio apartment. Um, and we've been living in there for the last two years. <laughs> it has not finished yet. Okay. <laughs> This is one of those other trials and tribulations I've been talking about because, you know, at first when we had a newborn in this situation, like lights were out at 930. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. And now it's just like, OK, um, literally I'm in my office currently, but the crib is over there. So he has his own bedroom now <laughs> in my office. So we can actually stay up till midnight if we choose to. Uh, we don't, but. No way. No way. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, like this is still the trials and tribulations that we're going through. Um, the We decided not to build um, at the racetrack and the land that we were going to build on now is claimed eminent domain for PPNL to run electric. Through. It's all the things, right? Like it's just a never, it's this. It's, yeah. it's right. It's yeah. never ending. Um, so 
we are at our wits end living in here. Uh, but again, it's what we have to do at the moment to set our next goal of building our house and working through the trials and tribulations of that until that moment flourishes. And then we can move out of the race shop, which I can't deny has been very good for me because I'm able to raise our child. And if I need to run to my office real quick, I can. Mm -hmm. Um, so you always have to find the silver lining on the gray rainy cloud. Yeah, that's so true. That's, that's, that is seriously what I have been working so hard on probably last okay forever but like really noticing is we we're here but we want to be here and it's like you know it's gonna be like this however you need to be grateful for the season you're in and it mm -hmm. it can get it can be so hard because it's like you had this envision of the the house on the hill the track over here the shop over here and it's changed you yes. know, it's changed and and that's okay. It's changing for a reason. Like it's hap life is happening for you. It's not happening to you, but when you're in the thick of it, it's like, okay, how can I make this sunshines and gumdrops as <laughs> right? Because I mean, like David, he's, he walks to work every morning. Right. And yeah. he's like, where before, you know, we lived 20 minutes from the shop. Well, that was his like calm down time, right? Like he could process things because he was in the car by himself, you know, and everyone processes things differently. That's where he made a majority of his phone calls. Now he comes home and he's at the dinner table making his phone calls. And I'm like, can we just eat for a minute? Like, so there are, again, there's always that shitty part. <laughs> yeah. um, but truth. it's it's life and you just have to again the end goal is still the same it's mm -hmm. just changed to get there and you know maybe one day we'll be fortunate enough to sell it all and go buy a beach house somewhere and uh hopefully there's a racetrack nearby I was gonna say are we gonna still be in racing I don't know I'm I'm already at the point of like everyone's all oh I'm ready for race season I'm like I'm I'm not I'm not. Yeah. So. Ours is what? Three, three and a half weeks away. Yeah. yeah. Three and a half it's, weeks away we leave. And, you know, you got to go test before you just roll into Volusia. So that adds like three extra days. And it's just like, and now, you know, we race into November, December, and we could be in Arizona or New Mexico racing at the Wild West shootout. And I'm just like, our race season continues to get longer and longer and longer. And I'm like, no, because we're all getting burnt out way earlier now. And it's just, I don't know. I like our old way of racing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So what would you, okay. So with that, what would you say is like the biggest struggle in racing? I mean, I don't know if it'd be for me that the racing never ends, but I feel like it's, I don't know. What would you say is a struggle? So for us, um, our biggest struggle is to stay on top mm. as, as a business, right? Mm. Um, you look at it at all forms of racing, whether it's NASCAR, sprint cars, late models, modifieds. I swear every, every division goes through it. Like there's always one chassis manufacturer that's on top. And then the next year it's a different chassis manufacturer and the next year it's different. And so that game is very hard for us because um, David takes it very, very personally. Um, he's the one out there that is R&Ding the car. So be, people will be like, oh, how many races did you win this year? And David's like, uh, you know, like eight. We're not there to win races. Um, I mean, we are, but we're not, right? So yeah. we are we are the R&D team for, <laughs> for Lethal Chassis. We are research and development every single time we hit the racetrack because we're always trying to find that extra nugget, that little tenth of a second um, that we all live for to give us that edge above every sing everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, so we're constantly trying new things every single time we hit the racetrack and whether it works or it doesn't work or, you know, we try something in the heat race. Well, that didn't work. Well, that set us back that we're going to start 12th in the feature instead of starting up front. And then everybody's like, oh, what happened? Well, we're trying something new to make our customers better. Like this isn't about David winning races. This is about making our race cars fast so that our customers are successful because that is ultimately what sells our race cars. Mm -hmm. So that struggle is very difficult. Um, 
I'll be the first one to admit that we went through a really rough patch last year. Like David was like, I don't know where I, what Island I've put us on. Like we are nowhere near where we need to be. And then, you know, many, many, many late nights out in the shop, you know, and I'm raising my child by myself in the evenings and I'm just like ready to pull my hair out. But he found it. He figured it out. Well, something wasn't right. This needed fixed. And then we just started winning races like crazy, you know, so it's that's a struggle. People expect us to win because he's David Stremme. He ran a NASCAR. He's got this. He's got a, no, like, that's not why we're here. We are here to make our business successful. And the only way that happens is us by continuing to keep our customers on top. And so that struggle is really hard. Man, that was, yes, I feel that. I absolutely feel that. So that leads me into is the struggles of the negativity. You know, I, I again, I'm just going to connect. Like I can probably sense how you deal with it, but how do you help David deal with it is what I'm <laughs> curious with. Okay. Yeah, it's it's tough, right? Um, And I, I try to be the cheerleader, right? That's what we're here for. Um. And then there are times that I will just flat out be 100% honest with him because he needs to hear it. Mm -hmm. And there's one line that I have always used from the very beginning that there is no one that I will ha fight harder with than the person that I'm willing to fight the hardest for. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he'll come in and I'll be like, what, what were you doing? And he's like, what do you mean? And he starts off and he, well, my car was this and this guy was here. But, and I'm like, no, I told you to go to the top three laps ago. You finally went to the top and my God, we passed three cars. Like, you know, so it's, it's that communication of honesty and I don't know, they always have a comeback, right? Oh, yeah. Like, I feel at least mine does. Like, if I'm like, hey, why'd you do this? Well, you know, I was tight in three and four, and then I have this happened, and well, then I hit the uke tire, and then it tweaked. There's always an excuse. And I just want to be like, yeah, but the two laps prior to that, like, what uh, that excuse doesn't hold. So, mm -hmm. what was going on? You know, like, it's never, it's never his fault. No. <laughs> but but no I'm just being sarcastic somewhat <laughs> to a degree there um but no it's hard right so I try to be very honest and deliver what I think he needs to hear I try to keep it short and concise because he doesn't want to hear me nag at him because nobody no husband wants to hear their wife nag yeah. so I try to keep it short sweet to the point and then if he really needs to hear it like I'll pull him aside and be like yo you sucked you need to get your head out your butt like I know you're better than this and we suck right now and we're gonna figure it out but you need to pull your bootstraps up and let's go like and there's a time and place for all of it right it's and and that was hard that was a struggle too like learning all of that is is a process like with, I mean, I don't know like how involved you were with your dad with racing, but like my dad, every, like I was literally trained yes. that yes. when you when, watch it, yes. When he would come in my, my dad's first question, what did I do wrong? My dad never needed the, the vote of confidence. Whereas Mike, yes, he comes in, he doesn't he he'll come in from like hot laps and oh my god he'll come in from hot laps and I I look at him and I'm just like no we weren't good and then he's like kind of like what the fuck and I'm like well you were good what do you mean tell you and then he's like it was just the tires they weren't they weren't th whatever and I'm like okay so I I need to figure out I'm still I'm still working work in progress figuring out how to boost my husband's ego but at the same time be like bro this ain't working <laughs> like how how I don't know I don't know you, you definitely have to find your own way but my dad was very instrumental in that actually um because I was very involved with my dad's sprint car um you know I wasn't really I didn't get into the shops and all that stuff but I'd change gears I'd help bolt on tires whatever and I do that with David but I will be honest, the modified is obviously more technically inclined than a sprint car is. Um, there's a lot more moving pieces. Let's put it that way. 
Um, so when David comes in, it took a long time for him to listen to what I had to say. Um, I can't tell you how to make your race car fast, but I can tell you what it doesn't look like or what it should look like or what what's happening here or what's happening there in the turn. And so and so's car is doing this and your car isn't. And he, you know, like I am, I can do that very well from working with my dad. Yeah. And there was a time we were actually at a racetrack and I'm trying to tell David this and David's just like, he's hearing me, but he's not listening. Right. My dad finally pulled David aside and said, listen, she was the first person I went to every single time I came off the racetrack because she told me exactly what I was or wasn't doing. And it helped me. And she knows what she can see and she knows what she needs to see. So she might not deliver it correctly, which I had to work on. Yeah, um, yeah. He's like, but what she does have to say is very informative and is going to help you. You need to listen to her. So my dad actually stepped in at one point and and really helped that transition. And then, of course, I had to learn delivery. Yeah, yeah, that's because he's not my dad. He is my husband. He is my partner. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and like, <laughs> like we want we want them to succeed. So we're right. trying to help. But again, yeah. it's it's definitely the delivery. So I'm. Stay tuned. <laughs> I'll let you know if I accomplish it. I'll well, let you know. We're 14 years into this and I'm just figuring it out. So, and I still screw up. So, okay. So I've got like six more years. <laughs> I've got time. I've got time. Oh my God. Okay. So with that being said, um, I don't want to like hold you up too much. Um, okay. So I want to close out, you know, you've given a ton of amazing tidbits. I'm Again, admire everything you do. At it's just it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing the balance that you have, um, and the, I guess the give and take, right? But what would you say for you know an, another fellow lady woman who's kind of just getting into this wild, crazy lifestyle that we've been living our entire life? Um, let's say they're either a race car driver or they're dating someone. Like, what piece of advice would you offer? Hmm. That's tough. Cause I, you know, I could go on for days probably, I guess the biggest thing that I had to accept and I knew it, but I knew it from my father, but I didn't really want to accept it as a wife or even as a girlfriend, honestly. But I think the biggest thing, and I hate to say it cause it sounds so like, eh, it doesn't sound good. Right. But mm-hmm. you will always be number two. You will yeah. always, you will always be number two. And if you can't accept that, and that's fine if you don't, like I respect that. Um, mm-hmm. because you know, we do live in this world of women empowerment and it's all about me, and and that's fine too. But in the racing world, it's just different. You will always be number two. And if you are not a strong enough individual, and if your relationship isn't strong enough, then you need to recognize that right up front Mm -hmm. because you will always be number two to that race car every single day and twice on Saturday night. (laughs) Do you? Okay. So I just started therapy again. Love therapy. Don't know if you've done it. It's yeah. highly suggested for everyone and so I started with a new woman I love her so much but just the other day she goes so it sounds to me like racing is at the center for your husband and I'm like yeah but I don't think I can fix that <laughs> so we're gonna have to bypass that and fix the other issues you know? <laughs> but it's so funny because just talking and all of a sudden she's like so it sounds to me like and I'm like yeah yeah I'm number two and I'm always and we're always going to be and we we accept it you know but we also you have to love the sport you know like yes. you do I mean I guess there are there are relationships out there that the wife never goes yeah. I don't know how they do it that's fine if it works for them it works but Absolutely. you have to accept it you can't that's let's say that that could be my piece off of yours is don't expect to change him yes don't expect going into it that you're gonna change him and get him out of racing you know like no no way yeah that's that you're ultimately gonna lose that battle 
yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day. And again, I know it, it just, I don't want to say, I don't know. It sounds negative, I guess, being that, oh, well, she's just willing to settle for number two. Well, yeah, I am because it's just as much my passion as it is his passion. Um, and that, uh, right. Like passion is something you can't be taught. You either have it or you don't. And I am very, very fortunate in the sense of what started as a hobby for my dad and our family racing became a love that yeah. turned into a passion, which has now become my job yeah. in every facet that I touch, you know, so I'm extremely blessed in that. So essentially, yeah, I'm number two to my husband, but in the grand scheme of things, we're number one because this is what we do and we're succeeding at what we do and we love what we do. We're not punching a clock for somebody else hating our lives every single day. Now, don't go, don't get me wrong. There are days that I'm like, it would be so much easier to just go work for somebody else. Um, but then I remember that I get to travel and I get to see the world, even if it's just one dirt track at a time. And I get to be with my child every single day and do all the things that, you know, I dreamed of as a little girl being able to do. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Oh my God. I love it. Perfect. Perfect ending. Ash, thank you so much. I absolutely adore you and I appreciate you. So thank you for joining in. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for thinking of me. Um, and like I said, the admiration is, is like wild, especially for your whole family. Um, I always, when I see BBJ, he always comes with a big hug and a smile. Um, and your dad is still probably one of my favorite memories at Charlotte a few years ago when he was like, you call us mud turtles. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. And he's like, what do you guys, what do you call your modifieds? I'm like, track packers. <laughs> and he loved it. So right back at you, girl. Um, I love what you do. I love how involved that you are with your family and racing and sharing it with the world as well. You're so sweet. Well, I look forward to continuing to watch your adventures and all that you guys are going to accomplish this year. So best of luck to all of you. I hope and pray I'm going to be seeing you at some point this year. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the life that we live, but everyone, thank you so much for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like it, please share it, tag Ashley, tag myself and um, definitely make sure to leave us some feedback. Love to hear what everyone thinks and hopefully we will catch you all either at the races or next week on next week's episode. Thank you.